Uh, I'm Matthew Goodwin, Washington University, and we're very happy to have with us uh, Joe Schwab, uh, who is now at uh, Cedar sinai in LA. He has been with us uh, before, I think uh, maybe two years ago, we did one of these, two or three years maybe. Um, but he's um, uh, an orthopedic uh, oncologist, also an orthopedic spine surgeon, and <clears throat> somebody who's been a great uh, friend and, and great mentor to me, uh, certainly uh, over now many years. Uh, and I think he is going to talk to us tonight about uh, artificial intelligence and some of the things that uh, he's been uh, working on, I would imagine. Uh, so Joe, I'll let you share your screen and kind of take it from there. Great. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm I'm going to be speaking uh, quite a bit about uh, AI-driven wearables and and why why I think they're going to be important. I will talk a bit about uh, some of the wearables that, that my group has developed, uh, but but uh, we'll be speaking about wearables generally in in musculoskeletal care. I hear my disclosures. I, I don't have anything that really pertains to this talk, but I do have several patents on wearable devices that that there's no commercial entity associated with them, but we do have patents. Um, I, at Cedars, I run a, a center, a center called uh, Surgical Innovation Engineering uh, with my partner, Hamid Gadnia, who was with me for a long time at, uh, at MGH. Um, and uh, uh, Hamid, along with Amir Yaskasti, are both uh, engineers. And so they're, they're really the brains behind the development of these devices. And, I'm, I, and I've provided the, the medical input and, and the uh, uh, driven that side of it. So it's really a team, a team effort. Um, one of the things that, that I, I've done in my, my career is, is, to do, is to work in predictive analytics and using machine learning. And one area that I've stayed away from a little bit is using the large national databases that are available, the you know, so-called big data in healthcare. I've used smaller um, bespoke databases. And, and, and the reason that there is, is uh, I think there's problems with these larger data sets, and I'll talk a bit more about that. But there's there are huge data sets available that pretty much everyone is aware of, and they've they in my view really underachieved uh, with regard to what we might expect for uh, using AI, and I think wearables will be part of the solution for that. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about why wearables are important now and why we're talking about them. Uh, the examples I'm going to go into are using wearable EMGs, uh, wearable electrical impedance technology, wearable acoustic technology, as well as integrated pressure mappings uh, with with wearable technology. So, you know, when we talk about the foundations of medicine, we always talk about history and physical examination. And you combine history and physical with, with imaging and labs and, and tests, um, and you come up with a diagnosis. And there's, there's a lot of nuance in this, as we all know, and particularly in the history and physical. But uh, oftentimes, when you look at these national data sets, the, the patients have been binned into certain CPT or ICD-10 codes. And that loses a lot of the nuance that, that we all know is, is important. And, and I, I think that, that um, that's problematic, especially when you start using machine learning algorithms. And so uh, this is one of the reasons why I've, I've hesitated a bit uh, with using in these, these large data sets. There really isn't a substantial, there is no contribution to physical examination other than um, how it was to, used to generate a, a CPT code. And that, that to me is problematic. Um, Particularly when you start talking, when anybody gives a talk about, uh, you know, whatever, whatever topic in, in healthcare, they talk about history and physical, and it's the beginning of all the book chapters, it's really important, art of medicine, um, yet it's, it's absent, right? We don't have it in most of our, uh, our data sets, even the bespoke data sets don't, don't emphasize it, and why is that? It's in part because uh, people don't document it, um, and in part because there's a lot of variability in examination. And in part because people don't do physical examination, at least completely, um, the way that we were taught in, in medical school anyway. And so that makes it very, very difficult. So it's, the data is either not there, um, and certainly not included in, in, the, in the CPT or, or ICD-10 code. And that makes it impossible, in my view, to really have a great risk assessment. If you don't have the nuance of, of, of healthcare, then you're not going to be able to risk assess in a way that's meaningful to, to clinicians. Um, and this is borne out in a, in a study published in the American Journal of Medicine. They, they were auditing uh, physical examination. They found that 
in, in uh, two thirds of the cases, there really was an absent examination. There wasn't, wasn't a, a pertinent examination done. Or in some cases, 14% in their study, the proper sign may have been elicited, but it was misinterpreted or the proper sign was not, was not sought. And so this, this resulted in, in missed or delayed diagnosis in, in uh, three quarters of patients. The point is that there's a problem in uh, generally speaking in healthcare with, with uh, uh, our ability to perform physical exam and certainly uh, document the physical exam. And that's completely lost when you start going into a big data sets. In, in my field, which uh, originally was orthopedics, it's, it's similar. You know, we like to think of ourselves as the experts in musculoskeletal examination. But in this study published in JBJS, they, they found that even residents who were scoring above the 90th percentile in their in-service examinations were only getting three quarters of the questions right on a physical exam question. And so the knowledge base is, is not there. If you don't have the knowledge base, it's really going to be hard to, to conduct the, the proper physical exam. So, you know, what, what are some of the other issues associated with, with big data? Um, patient reported outcomes, right? So that's, that really has been thought to be the holy grail in terms of outcomes. How do we, how do we you know, so-called value-based healthcare, how do we compare patients and, and outcomes? Well, we're going to use these patient reported outcomes, but uh, there, are, there are some exceptions. Um, I think, you know, Henry Ford Hospital has done a nice job at University of Rochester. I'm sure there are others. But the exception proves a rule in the sense that most, most people are not using patient reported outcomes as part of their clinical practice. Most patients, um, when they come to see their doctor, are not looking forward to hearing about their patient reported outcomes. It's not integrated into care. And so um, if it's not integrated to care, it's not being measured regularly, it's not going to make it to the machine learning algorithms. And again, this is one of the reasons why uh, machine learning algorithms or big data are underperforming in, in, uh, in generally in healthcare. What about patient demonstrated outcomes? And patient demonstrated outcomes have been around for, for a long time. This is the, the timed up and go, you're, you're all familiar with it. And this is a great test, I think. If you, if you look and see what, you're, what, what you, this patient is doing, the timed up and go, um, keep in mind, the, the, um, you're, you're really recording the time. So all of what this patient is doing, patient standing, you know, walking three meters, turning around and sitting down, there's actually a ton of information you can get from, from watching the timed up and go and if, if you're quantitating various aspects of it. But right now, um, the way it's used is really is uh, just the time. Um, and that's how a lot of these patient demonstrated outcomes uh, are going. And, and frankly, there are, there are a few centers that are, that are really using these, these patient demonstrated outcomes effectively. I was just at MD Anderson not long ago, and, and I have to say they're doing an incredible job. Uh, uh, Val Lewis's group is, is using a lot of patient demonstrated outcomes more than I've seen anywhere else. Um, all right. Well, don't know what happened there exactly. Some kind of a power surge or I don't know. Anyway, I was speaking about uh, patient demonstrated outcomes and what I was trying to uh, show was the, um, there are problems with things like the timed up and go, the reliability and the iterator reliability is relatively poor, even though I think it's a great test. And one of the reasons I think it's, it's uh, poor is that you're really only relying on time, and there's a lot more you can gather from from this patient if you were using wearables. Um, and so, what are we aiming to do with with wearable technology? Really, what we're trying to do is to quantitate physical assessment, and that includes physical examination, but it goes beyond that. So, when we're talking about physical assessment tools, you're talking about uh, disease specific assessment tools that are used. Uh, say, for instance, to monitor someone with Parkinson's disease as an example. Um, these are physical assessment tools that are available, uh, but currently right now are, are really semi-quantitative. Um, I believe and I think people are showing that uh, with wearables and with the technology that's being developed, we're going to be able to reveal tech, uh, aspects of human physiology and pathology that we have not been able to study in the past. And a simple example is you know, we've all had a patient who, who um, hurt their knee, for instance, and, you know, now six months later, their, their back is bothering them and they, they feel like it's because they've, they're using their muscles differently. And that's something we tell patients and patients tell us, but there's no data to say that that's true. And the reason there's no data is because we don't have a good way of, of uh, assessing muscles in, in real time. And that's, again, where wearables, I think, will, will, um, uh, will be useful. I do think patient reported outcomes are helpful, but I think patient demonstrated outcomes, particularly when they become quantitative, will, will supplant patient reported outcomes. And I think it'll be an important part of how we assess patients, not just in our office, but uh, outside of our office. Um, and why, why are we doing this now? 
Well, there's there's several reasons why, and, and in fact, a lot of the technology that we're that I'm talking, I'm going to be talking about, has been around for a long time, but they weren't useful to us. And the reason is, for instance, cloud cloud based computing not been around for that long, and without it, you couldn't do this. The the advent of the the GPU, particularly with Nvidia, you keep in mind. NVIDIA was pushing for, for the gaming industry, right? So you're looking at a screen, each one of those pixels on a screen represents a number. And so you say you have hundreds or even thousands of pixels. Well, those are being put into very complex, say, say a, a convolutional neural network, a deep neural network that has, has multiple layers. You're talking about uh, millions and in some cases, billions of, of uh, quantitative analysis uh, being done in parallel. And that wasn't possible before the GPU. It's why NVIDIA is doing so well from a stock perspective. Uh, advances in algorithms is also part of it, although the convolutional neural network, um, you know, created by Jeff Hinton and his group, uh, Google and Toronto, that is still the, the gold standard. There's been some advances, but it still works extremely well. Um, and, and of course, the Internet of Things. And this is why we're able to talk about this now, even though, as I say, some of the technology is, is uh, somewhat old. There are tons of, of uh, products already available. Most of us have some of these on right now. But most just really track your location or they're, they're maybe an accelerometer or a gyroscope. That's what most of the, so there, there are some limitations. When we talk specifically about uh, musculoskeletal health, you're, you're talking about electromyography, motion tracking, um, also uh, uh, gyroscopes, uh, electrical impedance tomography, and acoustic signal technology. My group is particularly interested in the, the last two. If you, uh, when we talk about EMG, really what you're doing is you're, you're measuring voltage changes in muscle. And so this is a nerve has activated a muscle. You get voltage changes in the muscle. So both of those have to be working. And the, the EMG is picking up these, these voltage changes. Usually when we think about this, we, th we think about diagnostic EMG and what's happening there. You have to put a needle into the muscle you're, you're trying to test. And that's how you localize. That provides the spatial resolution for the EMG. It's painful. Um, you, you don't want to send your patient there every time. You don't want to go through this all, all the time. Um, and, but this is the way to get spatial resolution for uh, EMG. However, there, there, you can pick up voltage changes in muscle with surface EMGs. Um, this is just an example of, of, say, a surface EMG. But again, you're not getting the spatial resolution with a surface electrode. You, you can apply electrodes all around the, the limb, and that gives you some more spatial resolution. Um, but it doesn't give you much information about the deep muscles. And so there's, there are real limits to, to EMG, but it is, it is something that's it's being used today. There's lots of companies. Here's an example of a company out of Italy uh, that's developed these surface EMGs. They're, they're proud to show that they, that they uh, are, have waterproof EMGs. And you notice there's multiple EMGs on these patients. Why? Because they need to provide, that helps to provide some of their spatial resolution. The key here is that you have them on both limbs, right? You have to track both limbs because you're looking at differences between the two limbs. And this is particularly useful. You can imagine uh, studying somebody who's had an ACL and their quadricep, for instance, is on one side you know is going to be weak relative to the contralateral side. And you can watch over time the changes in the, in the ipsilateral quadricep versus the contralateral and track that. And so there are some, some uses, and, and this is what some, many companies are out there um, that are available or trying to, to push this. <clears throat> so the pros of the EMGs uh, are that it's, it, may be track, it may be valuable in tracking muscle injury. It's relatively simple. It's, it's been around for a long time. But again, simple. Uh, there's relatively limited spatial resolution and limited insight in, into uh, uh, function. <clears throat> And what about what about motion capture? When we talk about motion capture, we're we're talking about the the uh, optical motion capture devices. For anybody that's done any work in a biomechanics lab, this is something you've probably done. Those little silver balls that you have to they have to be in the line of sight of the camera. That's more for research purposes, but you can use an accelerometer or a gyroscope and have patients you know, wear wear these and wear these outside the hospital. And this is really what a lot of a lot of different companies are using. Uh, and in fact, a lot of physical assessments are being done with gyroscopes and accelerometers now. And this is, is uh, um, uh, the, the future. Um, this is used very regularly in physical therapy already. It's used in animation and in the gaming industry, uh, medical monitoring, and it's used in training and simulation. So it's, 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 very, it's a mature, uh, relatively mature platform. This is an example. It's a company um, 
that has a suit with these IMUs. And so they're using this in particular for, for um, uh, developing animation. It can also be used in video games. But you know, this is if you're trying to develop a movie, for instance, you might you might use something a technology like this. And so there are companies out there. This is one of the more advanced companies um, that that uh, provides this. And so um, you could you could see well, this is probably more useful in, in different industries, but maybe less in, less useful in, in healthcare. Um, here's another one. This one is used in physical therapy, and so again, they're using accelerometers and gyroscopes here, and they generate this image on the right. Um, and what they're really tracking here is just is just range of motion, but this is calculated range of motion. It's not actually the range of motion of these limbs. They're doing a mathematical calculation, um, which you know is, is legitimate, but it's not a direct measurement of, of the range of motion. And so you can imagine uh, if you're following again a patient who's who's uh, injured. And I think here the key the key is you're looking at at uh, the injured limb versus the healthy limb and looking for changes over time to develop progress. And so this is why so many of these applications are are seen as as useful for. Uh, for physical therapy or in physical therapy. Um, the concept of, of quantifying motor impairment uh, using wearables is, is not new though, right? Especially in movement disorders, uh, Parkinson's disease in particular has been using this for a long time. With the first use of an accelerometer back in 1983, they were using smartphones to, to monitor tremor. Um, and and uh, again, used accelerometers in, in different clinical trials in multiple studies in the last, in the last uh, several years. So it's, it's not a it's not a new phenomenon. So again, why why am I really pushing this now, and why do I think it's 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 uh, more useful now? Part of that is because the, the the amount of data that you're generating with an accelerometer, if you really want to gather all the data that's being produced, it's pretty tens of megabytes per minute of data, and it's it's. Uh, before cloud computing, difficult to manage that, right? If you have an edge server, you can do that. But if you don't, it's pretty difficult to put this all on your computer, for instance. Um, and, and let's say you have this data and you want to extract the features. It's not easy to do that. That often is benefited by the use of machine learning. So feature extraction of the data is something that's really, really important and where machine learning really fits quite, quite nicely in, into this amount of data. And we use this quite a bit in, in, in our lab as well. So here's a nice study published last fall, and this just shows a, a good example of how wearable devices, I think, will supplant clinical assessment tools. Uh, this is a, a study where they followed patients with Parkinson's disease for over a year, and they followed them in two ways. In one way, they used the, the gold standard clinical assessment tool for Parkinson's disease. And then the other way, they, they looked uh, at the accelerometer and the gyroscope, and they followed these patients for over a year. None of these patients were on a drug. They were just looking at the natural history. And what they found was that if they looked at the clinical assessment tool, all the patients were stable. Nobody had progressed. None of their disease had progressed. But if they looked at the data from the gyroscope and, uh, and the accelerometer, all the patients had worsened. So imagine you're trying to develop a drug and you're, you're showing some subtle changes even in the course of one year, which may end up being profound changes over the course of a decade. And you're, you've, you've missed an opportunity to get your drug approved because your clinical assessment tool wasn't sensitive enough to pick up those changes, whereas an accelerometer or gyroscope was. This is just one example, but there's other examples in, in different diseases where this sort of technology um, is becoming uh, more accepted and, in fact, is, is superior than most of the clinical assessment tools that we, we currently have. The motion trackers, they're, they're easy to use. They're, they're used in lots of different industries already. They can be used remotely. You can send patients home with them and collect data. Pretty easy. Um, but again, you're not truly measuring underlying physiology here. You're, you're just tracking their motion. And, and so it's useful. And it's, it's, this is not going away. There's lots of devices uh, that, are, that are being incorporated into neurologic and, and musculoskeletal patients. Um, but I think that there are limits to, to the data you can gather using motion tracking alone. So we'll go into a little bit about what my group is doing. And, and um, one of the, I guess, from a 10,000 foot view, the, the big thing that we're doing differently is that we're actually sending energy into the patient and then reading that energy after it's transferred, transferred through the patient. And the energy that we're using, we're either using electrical energy or acoustic energy, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, or we're using light. So really three different forms of, of uh, energy and three different outputs. Um, and you have a lot more control when you when you know when you're putting the energy in and how much energy you're putting in, uh, which frequency, for instance, and and uh, what what the output is. So you can gain quite a bit more information using using this methodology. So just as an example, you've got in the in the upper right there, you've got a signal transducer, 
um, that's sending a signal through through the tissues, and then you've got a, a receiver, right? That's in essence what we're doing. Uh, in this case, with acoustics or or with uh, electrical energy. Now, this is a, a schematic of one of our devices, and so this device um, has transducers all around the calf, right? Each one of these transducers can send a signal, um, but they can also be be a receiver, right? They can be an antenna, and so um, depending upon where you're sending the signal, um, the the not the the uh, transducers that are that are not sending the signal are acting as a receiver. <clears throat> Very importantly, uh, and, and just to give you an idea of the complexity, so imagine you're sending this acoustic signal through the tissue. So what, what happens to the acoustic signal? Well, depending upon the tissue that it's going through, it's either going to be reflected back uh, or absorbed or refracted or transmitted. And, and again, it depends upon the tissue. So, you know, fascia is going to behave differently than, than fat or different than muscle. A hydrated muscle is going to be different than, than non-hydrated muscle. Fatty infiltrated muscle is going to be you know, different than non-fatty infiltrated muscle. Um, osteoporotic bone is going to behave differently than, than normal bone, right? So you can get a huge amount of information uh, be, because of the different, the different uh, characteristics of the tissue. Just think about how, how do we know that the center of Earth is, is, uh, is, is magma, right? It's, it's not solid. How do we know what's inside a, a, a mountain? We know this because we send sound, uh, as one of the ways anyway, you can send seismic waves through these, these, uh, these structures and then receive the signal after they've gone through the structure. You know, hey, there's a lake inside this mountain, as an example, because you're gonna have, going through water is going to be different than going through solid rock. Granite's going to be different than limestone. It's the same sort of a concept, but it's being applied uh, to human tissue. And, and Joe, the, the, what you're describing there is designed to be dynamic in nature. Is that right? This is not, you know, it's not just looking at the tissue of a human. It's, you know, I'm just thinking about like uh, near infrared when you look at a muscle, you know, then you have the muscle contract and you see the saturation go down. Is that the same thing you're seeing, saying here? You're going to wear this? It's a, it could be a dynamic measurement of the tissue? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, that's the idea. Is and yeah. I'm going to give you. I'll show you some examples. This might be an example. Oh no, this is just an example of our uh, one of our electrical impedance tomogra uh, tomography devices. This is using electrical signal, not acoustic. Acoustic will follow. But what again? This is sending an electrical signal in, and then it's receiving it in the other other uh, transducers. And what this provides you is is uh, a real time information, highly spatially uh, high spatial resolution of which muscles are active and which ones are inactive. And this can tell you if you're, if you're healing a hamstring injury, for instance, uh, where that hamstring recovery is. And so it's dynamic. It's meant to, meant to be dynamic. Um, uh, so again, the, the, um, you know, using the electrical impedance tomography, there's, there's actually a lot you can do that we're, we're studying with. We're, we're looking at how the, the effects of, of, uh, um, you know, for instance, if you have a buildup of calcium in, in let's say you have a, a soft tissue injury, let's say you have a compartment syndrome or suspected compartment syndrome, and you're trying to discern whether or not you have a lot of a buildup of lactate in, in the swollen compartment or buildup of calcium, signs that the cells are, are not doing well. You can pick those up with uh, electrical impedance tomography because it affects the electrochemistry of the, of the fluid, and that can be done. So that's one way you can, you can sort of look at the physiologic effects of say compartment syndrome, um, it's just it's just an example, um, and so what that provides you is high spatial resolution. It, it directly assesses individual muscles. It can assess injured injured muscles as I, as I mentioned, and it doesn't rely on on signals being generated by the patient. You're generating the the energy, and that that is a big difference. Uh, the, the cons here it's it's very complex. Um, you know, measuring these signals and interpreting those signals requires. A, a lot of data, a lot of uh, machine learning, and the idea is you have to train that data so that then later, when you're when you know the signals and you and you you know the features that correlate to a certain injury or correlate to a certain movement, you can then apply those in real time dynamically. But you have to train the algorithms first. That's that's where we are in this process. All right, here's a here's a stupid question for you. Yeah. Uh, so the um um, oops, sorry about that. You know, so in, in any of these devices, I, just because I don't know enough about them, you know, I think about, you know, somebody does uh, whatever, bioelectrical impedance to look at body fat or, or something like that, which yeah. is one thing, you know, if you're wearing <laughs> this, do we, do we know a lot or a little about the safety of wearing a uh, device that's constantly generating a signal, an external signal uh, through your limb, for example, you know, does that have any effect long term? term or, or do we know or do we have things to compare it to 
Well, what I can say is that the, the energy level is really, really low. So I don't think you're going to get like a shock per se. What it does to, to your tissues long term, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows uh, uh, what, what, that, what that would do long term. And what, what, is long, what would be considered long term. There's a lot we don't know about the safety of these. I don't think there's a shock issue. But um, you're right. If you put this on a, a child and they kept it on their whole, uh, you know, uh, young young adult life while they're developing, could there be a negative effect? There would be an effect, right? Because all your your tissues are responsive to this these sort of signals. We know that, right? Um, and you know, that one of the reasons why we use tens units, right? But we still don't have a great explanation as to how they all work. Um, so yeah, we, we don't know the answer. Okay. Okay, so what about acoustic signals? Again, um, the the think of the the acoustic signals. I think are a little, are maybe a little bit easier for people to to understand. Just thinking about um, how we how geologically how we we understand rocks, and it's the same. It's the same sort of a concept. But as I mentioned to you, there's a, a lot of information that we're we're we can gather. Um, so in our lab, we've shown that we can tell when a, when a muscle is is passively moving versus actively moving. We can tell when when you have a five pound weight in your arm and you're and you're flexing versus versus just actively flexing. We can tell twenty pound weight is different. All those all those uh, um, signals are, are different. And is that is that useful? Well, it's it's useful probably in non medical areas like you know gaming for instance. Um, but uh, will it be useful in in in, uh, in healthcare? I think it will in, in some other ways in terms of understanding bone health for instance. Another area that we're we're interested in. Here is a, uh, I think there's a misspelling there, monitor. <laughs> um, anyway, this is the, the uh, video. This is basically relatively rudimentary work that we did, we did this last year, but this is basically just following gestures. And so you can actually do this with, with a, uh, an accelerometer, but what we're, what we're showing is that we're, we're picking up the, the muscle patterns. And so eventually we'll, we'll be able to tell which, which uh, arm position, which hand position, um, you're, you're in basically just on the the, uh, the pattern, the waveform pattern that we're seeing there. And that's going to be useful, again, for virtual reality or extended reality. Um, uh, but this is just a, a kind of a gesture, um, a gesture pickup here, just to, to illustrate the point of what we're doing. And then this one, uh, same, yeah, the same order. Um, okay, another one here. This is the actually, this is my my uh, I think uh, um, not the medical side of the team because it's obviously the breaker radiology reflex. But here, one of the things that I want to point out to you is the, the so we're we're able to quantitate the muscle response using uh, for for the breaker radiology reflex. Since that time, what we've done is we've developed a reflex hammer, so we know this the exact strike time and strike force when when we're striking the muscle or the tendon, and. What we're what we're doing, and it's it's actually quite nice in the in the Achilles reflex. We can see the shear wave uh, going uh, traveling from the strike of the of the hammer through the cuff, right? Because you have the mechanical energy that is being sent up the Achilles tendon, and then when it gets into the muscle, it's then become it becomes electrical an electrical signal transferred from in the nerves up to the spinal cord back down to the calf where you get the contraction. And the reason that that's so important is that that's a, a poor man's uh, nerve conduction study. So with this quantitation of the reflex, you can quantitate the muscle response, um, but you can also measure the time it takes for that muscle response to occur, which again is uh, a relatively easy nerve conduction study rather than sending it to an electrophysiologist. And so there, there, these are the types of, of um, uh, uh, examination or quantitation of physical examination that I think will change to a certain degree because you're no longer going to say my the reflex was plus one or the reflex was plus two. You're going to actually have, have a number and you're going to have a waveform. It won't just be the response. Uh, that, you know, it'll be it'll be the waveform that's generated because you can imagine somebody with diabetes has a different waveform in their muscle contraction or somebody who has fat infiltration of their muscle. And you you these are all patterns that are really fit very clearly into into using machine learning. Um, Okay, so the acoustic signal technology again. The, the pros here: you you accept you assess the mechanical properties of tissue, and this is not something we've been able to do readily, um, at least not to the extent that we're able to do now uh, before before using this technology. You can quantitate many different aspects of muscle and bone physiology, 
and you can quantitate neurologic assessments. Like, you know, how many beats of clonus was that, for instance? What was the Babinski response there? What's your what's your tendon response for, to the uh, you know the tendon stretch reflex? Those those are are, are nice exams. They're used all the time, but they there's a ton of problems with the inner inner uh, intraorator reliability with those studies. Um, but again, these require large large amounts of data. This is the type of thing we're working on in the clinic now. Um, so finally, I'll, I'll talk about the plantar pressure mapping. This is a little bit different technology. Remember, I mentioned we meant we're using electrical energy, we're using uh, acoustic energy, and we're using light. And in this case, what we're doing is we're sending light through a pane of glass. And so when a light goes through a pane of glass, um, it creates an electromagnetic wave. And that electromagnetic wave prevents any photons from escaping. So when you look at that glass, that pane of glass, you don't see any light. Now, when you stand on the glass or, or, or touch anything next to the glass, it disrupts the electromagnetic wave. It allows photons to escape, and then you can you see these photons. And th that uh, that energy that you're seeing in those photons, you can uh, use that to quantitate pressure. Um, that's really Hamid Gadia, my my partner. He figured that out mathematically how, how to do that. So he can look at the pixel of light and then correlate that to to a uh, um, an actual pressure map. So this is our this is our the beta version of our device um, that we we uh, this is a portable uh, device and just shows the how it's manufactured um, and you'll see this pane of glass coming in at the at the very end um, right through here and that's that's where the light is sent through that pane of glass and you stand on it. I'll give you an example. So if you see here, there's a patient who's looking up as a, as a, at a patient a standing. This is uh, you can see that their hands are at the side like a Romberg's test. And look at the upper right here. You see these photons that are coming through. With all these pixels, you you can you're calculating um, pressure, um, submillimeter pressure measurements. That that little dot is the center of gravity. So we can get the center of pressure for each individual foot and the center of gravity uh, for the patient at, um, at large. But we also can gain a lot of information about uh, the the um, mechanical properties of the foot uh, again through mathematical translation that Hamid Gadia, uh, my partner, has been able able to accomplish. But the point is, you can get a huge amount of information. So imagine you're you're um, you have a patient in your office, and you're trying to quantitate their Romberg test, right? So they're a little bit of a sway, you know, how, how much of a sway? Are they unstable? Should you operate on their cervical myelopathy as an example? Um, but here you can quantitate it. And so, um, and, and again, submillimeter uh, precision with this quantitation. And we think that this, this concept of, of uh, assessing balance, for instance, we're using this in a fall prediction study that we're doing. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of information that you're, you can gain here. Now, what if you could combine the two? Yeah, please. So the, the advantage of that using the light um, is that it's versus a force transducer is that you can be way more precise or is it that you yeah. can scale it down to a device somebody could wear or something or, or what? Well, it's so it's it's because of the precision. So what we've shown, we, we have a study that's coming out that we, we've shown in healthy subjects um, where you have a patient, uh, these are, you know, 20 some year old folks that are completely healthy. They, when you look at their center of pressure um, for both foot or their center of gravity, and you, there's a certain amount of sway that you see if they had a standing in neutral position versus various, you know, if, you know, um, if their legs are, are crossed or if they have the Romberg position, um, you really don't appreciate much, much sway when you're clinically watching a patient, especially a very healthy um, athletic person. But with the precision that we're demonstrating, you can actually see a substantial difference in their in their uh, um, in the center of gravity with the Romberg test compared to say standing in neutral position. And so the the um, some of the the level of precision that we're seeing versus a force a force plate, you, you just don't see the same the same level of uh, sufficient number uh, level of precision. With the force plate, I think it's um, and it's over five millimeters is, is their level of precision. We're submillimeter, and we're seeing uh, some of the changes that we found are below five millimeters of what you need to see. Before, you see what I'm saying? So the pathology the, you can pick up is, is the subtle pathology you can pick up much better with this. We also think that that um, we can pick up more information about the mechanical properties. That's something we're studying. We're studying right now. It's a, these are there's uh, that's not definitive yet. It seems like the theme of a lot of these is the is the picking up stuff we couldn't with other devices. I mean, I think I'm getting it. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, all these things are, none of this is new, as I said. Oh, the, the pressure plate's new. My, again, Hamid is a, is a really smart uh, guy, very, very mathematically inclined. And he was able to, to figure out the, the math behind transferring the, the, uh, the pixels to, to a pressure reading uh, and show that mathematically is correct. Um, oh, hold on a second. This is just the, uh, a video showing the combination of the two. And so, and this is, you know, I think where we're heading rather than have a, a static pressure plate, we'll probably, we were, when I was at MGH, we're designing a, a walkway and we'll probably do the same thing um, here at Cedars. Um, whereas right now we're, we're at a, a static measurement. Uh, eventually this will be something that you have patients walk, you'll be assessing gait um, in combination with their, the wearable uh, devices. So you're looking at their, what muscles are active and when compared to their, their, um, their gait. And I think that's where we're going to gain, um, quite a bit, quite a bit more information. And, and I'll, uh, this is just, just going to show you a little bit of this, a little bit of a busy, uh, busy video, but it, it does illustrate the, the, um, the, uh, large amount of data. So upper left, you see this person has the, has the, uh, uh, wearable cuff on the calf, and next to them you have the the uh, motor responses that you're seeing, um, and then below you're seeing the pressure plate. And so this is just walking, you're seeing what's happening with the center of gravity. You're looking at uh, what's happening with their muscles, um, and these are muscles. You obviously circumferentially all the muscles, um, and being able to discern which ones are moving. Here again, going to the going on a, a, the heel. Um, similar, these are things we do all the time in clinic, right? We have patients stand their heel, stand their toes, and we say, yeah, they're able to do it or they weren't able to do it, but you're missing a lot of other information that you could, you could gain uh, from, from these patients. And so imagine you have a patient with a, uh, an evolving foot drop, for instance, and you're trying to quantitate that a little bit better than the, the typical motor, motor um, exam. You can also pick up the amount of pressure that they're, that they're forming under the feet. So the point is that there's a lot of information that we, every day in our clinics, we see, but we, we just like the time up and go that we're not, we're not collecting. And, and uh, you know, the, the signals that are being generated there fit very, very nicely into a machine learning algorithm. That's what you really need to, to, uh, to uh, uh, propagate a machine learning algorithm. And, you know, my bias towards this is that the, the way things will be in the future um, uh, are going to be quite a bit different. So, you know, remember, you see these old, old uh, po photos of uh, surgeons or doctors, they're taking the patient's pulse and they're putting their hand on the patient's head, checking their temperature or checking their blood pressure, what have you. That was done by, by physicians. Now, usually we just look at the vitals in the chart, right? Somebody else does that for us. And similarly, if you go have an EKG done, cardiologist doesn't put the EKG leads on you. A tech does. The tech puts the EKG leads and they're troubleshooting that and making sure you're staying still and they're making sure they have a good test. And then they give the results to the cardiologist who, who, who uses the data. And I think that that's a similar thing that's going to happen with a lot of physical examination, which the studies have shown is not being done, uh, period, by some folks or not being done very well by others. Um, and it's not being done in a, in a regular fashion. And then it's not being recorded or it's not being, it's not quantitative. There's lots of problems with what we're doing uh, with, with our examination. I think that before a patient comes in to see the doctor, they're going to be using some form of, of a, a wearable device going through a, a, an accepted routine that will provide a quantitative score and a metric of, of the, the, physio, the uh, musculoskeletal physiology of that patient. And then the, the, the uh, surgeon or uh, clinician will just use that data. And they may do a focused exam. But don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we're not going to examine our patients anymore. But there are some baseline things that, that some of us aren't even doing now that, that the data will, will be there for us. Um, yeah, I mentioned that. Um, so in conclusion, I, you know, big data is underperforming for lots of reasons. I, I, I'm a big believer that the, one of the problems is that we've, we're using CPT and ICD-10 for the wrong reasons. Um, and I think that's problematic, but I also think that we're, we're missing out, as I just mentioned, on physical examination, which we all say is very important, but our actions don't always, don't always follow that. Um, I, I think that this is not something that's going to go away. This is going to be more and more in use, and, you know, it may not be our, our data, but there's lots of other groups that are, that are very sophisticated doing really interesting physiologic work that I think it's only a matter of time before, before these wearables are a big part of um, not just what we do in healthcare, but it's already happening in fitness. But you can imagine if you uh, the information that you can gather, if you can gather it in healthcare, people are going to want it in the fitness world. So it's going to be very much part of the ecosystem that, that we live in, both inside and outside uh, healthcare. Um, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. And I, I want to apologize for the technical problems that I that I was uh, having there. 
So who, who are your peers? So, I mean, who, you know, like I look at this and it seems like, um, it seems like there would be a group of, uh, like physical therapy groups. It seemed like the biomechanists that do force plate stuff and motion capture with their camera systems would be involved. I mean, who's, who is in this space now and who do you, I can't imagine there are a ton of people like you in this position, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, but, but what, and how does that work? I mean, do you have their bio, biomechanists where you are now that are collaborating or not collaborating or think it's, you know what I mean? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the people that are interested in this area or have more experience in this area than I do are, it's often going to be pediatric orthopedic surgeons uh, or physiatrists that are in rehab centers where they have a gate lab, right? And so, and they're very interested in all these, these, these things, force plates and such. It's a little bit different because they're using different technology. So the technology, I don't, there's nobody doing what we're doing with the acoustics and uh, the electrical impedance, I think. There may be, but we the combination of the two, which is really what we're doing. I don't think anybody else is 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 working on. So there's lots of people that are working in, in this you know uh, this area, um, but I think they're working at it from a slightly different angle and, uh, than we are. And so, what do you think the major advantages in, in when you look at the clinical exam in the future? I mean, this is pretty fascinating to think about because um, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, and that is that the, the, you know, in the future you will get, or in the near future, you'll have some outputs from a patient wearing these things or having worn these things or however it works out that, that happens. Um, and you kind of already see all the things about their exam is kind of what I'm thinking, right? You see, they have a foot drop. You see that this, whatever is not activated, I guess, um, what's, is the major advantage that it just makes us more efficient? It makes us better. We pick up on things we didn't pick up well, before, which like, I mean, or is it vir know, virtually now you can you can examine a patient from afar. I mean, there's so many. Just seems like there's I, so many outputs from this. A lot. There's a lot of things. Well, think about this. Like you know, if you if you look at what's happening in healthcare, right? So CVS, as an example, has has uh, they're now in the primary care business, right? The CVS has primary care access in, in, in many of the CVS pharmacies, in, in, uh, and that's, that's part of their long-term plan. And who's running that for them? It's usually nurse practitioners or physician's assistants. And so that's going to be a primary care access for, for a lot of patients. But, um, you know, but, you know, the best physician assistant, the best nurse practitioner, they, they have, just like a doctor, they have a limited amount of, of training, right? They have a limited amount of experience. And so the way I see it, you know, once you've collected enough data, let, you know, just give you an example. So imagine, remember I was talking about this little runway that you walk on, right? So you're going to go see your, doc, your, your PCP and they may say, yeah, we're going to have you walk on, we're going to have you put on these wearables and walk on this walkway, this 10, this, you know, three meter walkway and do, you know, step on one foot, this kind of thing. And now if once you've created the data, so we have, now we've had a thousand patients with hip arthritis, before their surgery, a thousand patients with knee arthritis, myelopathy patients, somebody with Parkinson's, you know, thousands of Parkinson's. All, all of these patients have already walked on, on this device with a known diagnosis. Now a patient comes in to see their PCP, who's a PA, they walk on this and they'll get a list of differential diagnosis of what this person's problem may be. What, what does that do? What it does is it helps with referrals. It helps with, okay, how do, what, what do I need to do next for this patient? What's well, the unless, algorithm say? Unless it goes right yeah. to their my chart and then they get it and they see them they might have these 10 terrible things <laughs> yeah well well that's right i mean no no question but i think that that um you know there's there's just there's a lot of pattern recognition that we're all really good at and that's why they send patients to us um and and uh, but some of that is is uh is our patterns that can be picked up um uh, even without us frankly and and um you know that uh, i think that's what's going to happen Have you gotten any pushback from any of this, from any of your uh, colleagues or anything like that? Other, other. Uh, well, I mean, a lot of people don't believe. You know, they don't. Uh, a lot of people just are not. They don't buy that, and they don't. They don't agree with what I'm saying. And um, you know, they. They. Uh, but I. You know, to me, it's the the technology is here and it's being developed. We're developing. Other people are developing it. It. It is possible to. Their pattern recognition is what, what AI does. That's really what it does. And so, if you have devices that can pick up this uh, this data. And you have machine learning to be able to classify. Um, you, you're going to be able to assist doctors much, much better. I don't see it as a bad thing. I don't. It's not going to get rid of doctors, but it will help patients quite a bit. Imagine somebody lives in a rural area and they want to have a virtual visit with somebody. 
Well, they're going right. to be sent these devices in advance and they're going to go through the similar routine at home. And now they don't have to travel, you know, so far. They live in a, you know, a country that doesn't have easy access. I think it'll be much, much better uh, than, than it cur currently is. And we've all found that virtual visits can be helpful, right? But we do miss out on the physical examination part of it. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking about is when we started doing that, and we all kind of said like, well, we can't, can't really do the exam, you know? And even when we try to do right. those, you just, you just can't. And so yeah. it's interesting to think about if you have a different, almost a different system that's giving you that information, yeah. you know, non-biasly, right? It, it's really, uh, it seems like you could do quite a bit with that in terms of, uh, outreach or virtual or however you want to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, the focused examination that we all perform or, you know, or, or somebody who, who say is looking at a shoulder instability, that's probably not something that a wearable is going to be able to do. But all the other things, you know, that, where you're only going to be doing, need to do the focused examination, which is really what most people are doing in the first place. But how do they get to this, uh, the, the specialist who can do so right. they can do their, their focused exam? you got to make sure there's not something else happening as well. And that's where these wearables can be helpful. Right, right. Fascinating. Well, I think I think this is pretty amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's it seems like you can build a huge team with with a, a gazillion different projects from it. <laughs> yeah, we do, and so we're working with our movement <laughs> disorder folks. Um, we are working with uh, our, my colleagues in in uh, neurology. Uh, we're working with colleagues in rheumatology, and, and of course, neurosurgery and orthopedics, uh, very very much so. Geriatrics, huge area in geriatrics, fall risk, things of this nature. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, there is, we're, 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 our limitation right now is really just people power, right? We need, we need, uh, we need more people to, to be present to, to uh, uh, pay, put patients through the, the, uh, the test, frankly. Does anyone worry about any other providers that, you know, have, have made comments or worried about being, uh, I don't want to say being replaced, right? But that that kind of attitude. I mean, there's a few comments here saying, uh, you know, are they planning to progress in, uh, you know, neurologic diseases? Um, can it replace a nerve conduction study, for example? And um, you know, you, you would think that people that do those things would probably like it. I think because it's kind of higher fidelity. It seems like. Um, but I guess is there any is there any uh, any uh, field that feels like it could replace them? Or feels well, I think, you know, I just ask yourself if you think that there's going to be a, the same number of radiologists in 20 years as there are now. There's not going to be, right? It's just like there'll be fewer pathologists in, in 10 years than there are now. And, and that's, yeah, um, yeah. you know, um, do, do I think that they're going to get rid of pathology? No. Do I think they'll get rid of radiology? No. Um, and, and the other way to look at it is that, that um, you know, you, you might order fewer of those EMG tests, right? So, so you may need fewer of those, but you, you, there are going to be times when you need a, a full electrophysiologic assessment. But that said, um, you know, this is these, the way things are right now, if you can get a, a poor man's nerve conduction study that's painless, um, that, who wouldn't want that if you're a patient, right? I mean, to me, that's, that's progress. That doesn't mean it's better than a, a full electrophysiologic assessment. Um, just like, you know, if you have a radiologist that's doing remote work and they're having this algorithm running in the background, uh, helping them, you know, that's, that's better for, that's better patient care. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're replacing all, all doctors, but it's going to be different, you know, but again, ask yourself, is healthcare the way it's delivered right now, anywhere in the world, really, really great? I would say no, right? I mean, we, we have to find ways to, to improve, to improve it. And, and I mean, to me, the best way to do is to be involved with it. Um, they're not, we're not going to get rid of doctors, but it will be different. We know it's going to be different. It's different now than it was 30 years ago. Let's see. Well, this is, uh, yeah, I was just looking through some of the other comments here, but um, I want to thank you again for taking the, the, the time, especially uh, on your break. Uh, sorry to, to bother you when you're not even uh, uh, at home, but uh, thanks for getting us through this. And um, I, I, for one, will be interested to, as we see each other, hear more about which directions this is going, because uh, it seems you're kind of making me a believer because you've done it to me before with other AI stuff. Um, I was more skeptical uh, before than I am of this. This seems uh, pretty, very intriguing. And that's a lot of what we're hearing in the comments here as well. So um, thank you again. And I think there's a lot of us that'll be very interested to see where, where, where you take this. Yeah, I'm happy to, to um, uh, take, I'll put my, my email if you guys, for whatever reason, want to speak to me. Oh, perfect. And my cell phone number.
And then that way, if you guys, if anybody wants to talk to me, not that I'm the end all be all about this, but I have a perspective and I'm happy to speak to, to anyone um, that uh, would like to speak with me. Perfect. Well, Joe, thank you again. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. Sorry about the technical side. Here I am talking about AI and I can't even run my computer. It's fantastic. <laughs> happy to have you. Thanks, man. All right. Thank, thanks, everybody.